Oh, yeah. Guess what we're giving away today? The Prime Bundle. This includes Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro. You can get them for free. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours we drop this episode so that we rank higher on YouTube. Help us out. And if we pick your comment, if we choose it as the best one, we'll notify you by commenting underneath and you'll get free access to the Prime Bundle, both Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do those things. Be cool to us because we give you guys free great stuff all the time. Uh, oh, one more thing before we start this podcast. We're running a promotion on Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the already discounted Prime Bundle. All of them are an additional 50% off. Go check them out. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code June Prime with no space for the discount. All right? Enjoy this episode. You guys know Jack Elaine, right? Of course. Yeah. He's like the, Not personally, the godfather no, no, of uh, health and fitness. Right? Yeah, that guy's amazing. He was, a, he was definitely a pioneer uh, in our space. Way, Great, ahead, way yeah, ahead of his time. Way ahead. Remarkable man. By the way, little little factoid with that guy. You guys know he set the world record in push-ups and pull-ups in his 50s? Doesn't he have several? Such a badass. Doesn't he have several world records? Yeah, where he pulled a, a boat with his mouth uh, across the English Channel or something like that. He was 70 to celebrate his 70th birthday. He had... It was either 10 boats or seven boats with 70 total people in them. And he pulled it with his teeth and his hands and feet shackled oh like a dolphin. Yeah. And I think he went to Alcatraz. I think that's oh. what it was. But you can find the video on YouTube. So Handcuffed and shackled to Fisherman's Wharf while towing a half-ton boat. Today, the task of towing 70 people on board 70 rowboats one mile on birthday number 70 in water between 60 and 70 degrees. A piece of cake, right? I haven't eaten any of that stuff since I've been 15 years old. I was a full-blown sugar holic till I was 15, 15 years old. I committed myself, and that was it. It's one of those So things. much more manly than I even described. Yeah. Anyway, he's really, really, <laughs> anyway, one thing he used to say, there was a quote that he used to say, is he said that uh, nutrition is king and exercise is queen, or one or the other, and together you have a kingdom. So it was one was king, one was queen. Together, you have a kingdom. Oh, I've never heard that before. Yeah, so maybe, he, Doug, you can find yeah, the- probably should. He might have just made that up. The actual quote of, uh, oh, look at that. He did. He towed a flotilla of 70 rowboats during a mile-long swim from Long Beach Harbor to Queens, what is that, Queensway Bridge. Wow. On his 70th birthday. Oh, that's in Long Beach. That's, okay. it's, that's the thing. I'm, gonna, I'm How old was he when he passed? 90-something. 90-something. Yeah. But the, yeah, his quote is in regards to exercise and nutrition and how- they're both very, very, very important, right? One of them is important. The other one's important. Together, you have, you know, what he would say is, he said exercise is king. Exercise is king. Nutrition is queen. Together, you have uh, a kingdom. Okay, so which, I want to talk which, about- by the way, that statement's a little interesting in itself because, yeah. you know, we've been taught in the space that, you know, diet is 70% of your results, right? I mean, abs are made in the kitchen. You've been told so much that, you know, diet is everything, and mm -hmm. so- I do like this idea of, you know, drawing up an episode that we, you know, compare the two of them with all the... Yeah, let's pit them against each other. Yeah, and let's talk about let's talk about all the different uh, things that people are looking for whenever they're embarking on a fitness and health journey and the importance of nutrition and exercise in each of them, which one is more important, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, for each one of them, um, and, you know, kind of what they mean. Uh, the first thing, obviously... The number one reason why anybody ever starts a fitness journey is because they want to look better, whether it's fat loss or changing the shape of their body, right? Aesthetics are the number one goal. I mean, as trainers, when you would ask your potential client- Almost always. Yeah, it was always that, almost always, right? Even clients that had like a performance goal, they would even, they'd always say, and I and I wouldn't yeah. mind. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. it'd be great. Yeah. Like yeah. abs while I was doing that? <laughs> yeah. I was like, all right, I got you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So now you you, made, you said something. You said that, that, quote, abs are made in the kitchen. Yeah. Now, the truth is, the, and there's some truth to that, and I, this is, I think, where it comes from. If you want to get leaner, you have to create a, a caloric imbalance, right? You have to be burning more calories than you take in, or, or put it differently, taking less calories uh, than you burn. It's really hard to manually burn calories. It's, it takes a lot of work to burn four or 500 calories. By the way, your cardio machines are lying to you. That when they say that you burn 800 calories during an hour of cardio, mm -hmm. Bologna, yeah, just, it's much easier. It it's much easier to resist the extra large milkshake after your meal than it is to go burn off that milkshake. Or, it's, or, or to, or to put it differently, you could eat. I could eat 500 calories super easy, yeah. super fast, right? Yeah. 
burning it. It's like all kinds of work. So people who try to, to burn calories manually through exercise and try to achieve weight loss with that, studies show with fat loss, it's a, it's a terrible approach if you don't also address nutrition. It's almost always a failing approach. Now, there is another side to that, which is uh, exercise, although doesn't burn many calories, at least not in comparison to how many calories you can eat, it can speed up your metabolism. We talk about this all the time on the podcast. In this case, when it comes to fat loss, uh, resistance training or strength training can make a pretty significant impact. Well, and this is where I can get behind what Jack Lane said, which is exercise is king. This is where it can be king, right? Because in the, in the context of trying to lose body fat, lean out, which is the number one goal that most people sign up for, uh, building some muscle on your body is in result going to speed your metabolism up, which in result will make the, the caloric deficit you're talking about much easier to accomplish. It's a longer term strategy, but it's something that too will last longer that way as well. So, uh, you know, in terms of like what you're going to see as results, uh, it, it may be a little further down the road, but it's something that will be way more sustainable. Yeah. Now, realistically, I would say people would boost their metabolisms over a, a regular, you know, consistent workout over the course of maybe six months to a year. I would see clients have their metabolism boost by about 500 calories a day, which I think is relatively realistic. Of course, this is general, so it's different from person to person. In some cases, you'd see much more. In other cases, it'd be more, more challenging. But 500 calories of extra calorie burn all the time, that's pretty significant. You know, it's 3,500 calories a week uh, just supporting your extra lean body mass and the muscle that you've built. So that's pretty good. However, again, I want to go back. 500 calories are really easy to eat. So for fat loss, uh, the importance of exercise is to maintain muscle, maintain a fast metabolism, so you don't just lose weight, right? Losing weight can mean you also lost muscle. But for the fat, and it, so it helps you with the fat loss, but then, of course, the diet has to be a part well, of this. not just for fat loss, also for muscle building, right? You can also exercise and train all day, but if you don't give your body the nutrients that it needs to build muscle... That whole idea of us speeding the metabolism up doesn't end up working out for you. So right. you got to keep that in mind also. Right. Now, I will say this. When it comes to building muscle, uh, exercise is, pro is more important. I mean, you could have the best diet in the world. If you're not sending a signal to build muscle, you're not going to build any muscle right. at all. So when it comes to shaping and sculpting your body by building muscle, uh, exercise definitely is very, very important. And I look, I could build muscle on people with – you know, eating excess calories all day long. I mean, somebody who wants to lose, you know, who's just eating too much, just have them lift some weights and you watch them build some muscle. So when it comes to building muscle, I would say the exercise portion of that formula. You'd weigh that a little bit more. Yeah, high. is definitely, you know, more important. But overall for aesthetics, uh, I would have to say it's a, it's a 50 50, I would yeah. have to say, right? Yeah. Pretty much 50 50. It, 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 a lot of it is the reveal, right? Is, is nutrition based. And I think that's what people like to highlight the most, um, uh, you, you know, to be able to kind of present yourself. But, uh, you know, the, the work itself is really reliant on the exercise. Well, yeah. and most people are searching for whatever results they're chasing for as fast as they can get there. And if you are neglecting one side of this, uh, regardless if you could do it without it, it's going to take a lot longer and you're just extending your results as far as when you would get that if you neglect nutrition in this case or you neglect strength training. Totally. Now, the next one, uh, mobility, right? Mobility is your ability to move through full ranges of motion without pain. You've got good control and stability. So it's not just range of motion. It's not just flexibility, but rather you own that range of motion, that flexibility. You have strength within it. So fluid movement. Yeah. So it's like you can get. It's, it's the difference between sitting in the in the splits, but sit, or sitting in the splits, be able to stand up out of the splits, or not hurting yourself if someone jumps on you when you're in the splits. Right. Mobility is strength, stability within a range of motion. Now I'll start with nutrition. With that, can nutrition improve or decrease your mobility? Well, I guess it can by contributing to inflammation. Right. I've had clients. Mm change their diets and notice less pain because of less uh, inflammation. That's really the only angle I can see is I have had situations like that where there was a lot of in inflammatory type foods that 
uh, were causing this type of stiffness or pain and restriction within uh, the movements itself. But uh, it, in terms of like actually like going through mobility and gaining uh, more strength in range of motion, I, I would have to weigh oh, exercise totally. well, what highly ab- on this one. What about the role that it plays with body fat, though? Somebody with higher body fat percentage, I would imagine, is going to mm. be limited with their mobility That's compared to point. somebody who is leaner. So. You know, it does play a little bit of a role also there. So obviously, yes. immediately, it plays a role with inflammation, but long term, it plays a role with the reduction of body fat. If somebody, if that same, that. if somebody, let's I would say all of us in this room, if all of us, you know, we're all carrying a little bit of body fat on us right now, Sal, a little bit less than most of us right now. If you were to drop 10 pounds of fat off your body right now, do you think you would be more or less? Sure, mobile? because your, your, your body fat is this weight that just kind of sits on you. It doesn't, it's not really functional. I mean, it's got some function, but not much. So if you gained 30 pounds of body fat, it would be like wearing a 30 pound weight vest. That's right. So now, however stable you were in particular positions, you're less stable now just because you're heavier. This is why when people lose weight, they notice dramatic improvements uh, in their mobility. Right. So that's a great point. So through weight loss or fat loss, through the reduction of inflammation, um, diet plays a role in mobility. I had a client once, in fact, we were trying to address some chronic back uh, issues, back pain issues, and uh, the diet made a significant, in improving her their uh, fluid intake, drinking more water, mm-hmm. actually made a pretty pretty decent difference in in their back pain. Well, if that counts, right? Drinking yeah. more water, I, that would definitely be a contributing yeah. factor. Yeah, but but when it comes to just impacting your mobility overall, exercise here weighs much heavier. Are, I mean, are we oh, going to play? Heavier. Are we going to play the same game that we do yeah. with the first one? Which is this a has 50. to be like 80-20, I would say. Yeah, or that's at least not 90, bad. 10. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I think. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah the first idea. one fifty fifty. This one, I say like yeah, eighty twenty. I would say eighty twenty, or at the most seventy thirty. You know, exercise 70 or 80 okay. to the diet being, you know, 20 or 30 at the most. I like that. I can get yeah. down so, with that. And it's cool because as we go down, if you find one, you're listening or watching the podcast and there's one that you really want to work on, it'll help you put more focus yeah. on the Prioritize one. it a little more effectively. Exactly. Uh, the next one is uh, performance. So performance, we're talking about uh, strength, speed, endurance, like, uh, you know, your agility, your body's ability to move and perform. Let's start with the diet side of it. Can diet affect your performance, both negatively and positively? Absolutely, it certainly for sure. can. Yeah, for sure. I've noticed, uh, you know, differences in my performance if my carbohydrates are too low, or if my digestion is off because I'm eating foods that are not affecting my de- digestion well. I can see that I'm more bogged down or lightheaded or not as focused. So there's definitely definitely an impact with uh, with diet. Well, too, I noticed like some of the best performing athletes have figured this out that it's a vital component. There's a lot of athletes out there that can get away with eating a little bit more uh, excessively and not probably the, the highest quality that they could be, uh, just because their their priority is so focused on exercise and movement and performance uh, that it's sort of. Uh, you know, they're working in spite of, yep. of all that. But um, this is definitely, if, if they were to look further into their nutrition, they'll find that, that they could, you know, sometimes it even leads more towards uh, injury, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where the inflammation itself is a contributing factor, which then leaves them susceptible with, you know, some some other th- like underlying issue that, you know, may aggravate it a bit more in that direction. Well, speaking of athletes, I really think that the, in the last two decades, I th- the progression that we've seen in almost all sports, I think is nutritional science. Yeah. I think that where we've come That's where you see the biggest difference. Yeah. And I know they did a really cool TED talk that we've all watched before that talks about like, you know, the number one thing actually is related to like the gear that they wear and, mm-hmm. and, and that yeah. type of the sport. democratization of sports. Yeah, and that, that and that yeah that made a big difference, Easy right? For you to say. <laughs> I, know, I, was, I was trying to put, put it out there, but, <laughs> but when I look at the the last you know twenty to thirty years of you know high level sports. You look at the amount of attention that these professional athletes now are putting towards nutrition. It's so different than what it used to be. And now you're starting to see that bleed into even like younger kids. Younger Mm -hmm. kids are now starting to pay attention to that. Where when I was growing up, that was that was an afterthought. Like you didn't even think about nutrition. You just you did your sport as much as you could. Totally. Now, that being said, uh, whereas most of the money, energy, structure, programming, being spent diet or exercise workouts training skills acquisition for sure that yeah it's it's the workout portion right like and it's funny we talked about aesthetics earlier 
you look at bodybuilders when they're getting on stage to get lean, most of their attention's placed on their diet, right? Mm -hmm. When you're looking at athletes, football players, baseball players, any other type of athlete, yes, at the high levels, nutrition is definitely a focus because it plays a role. But most of the focus, for the most part, is, it's an afterthought, which yes. is kind of what I experienced going through that. But there are specific sports too that require you know different type of nutrition strategies, and two ones that require cutting and require you weighing in. And so I would, I would, if we were to kind of be nuanced about this and like go through each specific sport, you might have a little bit different ratio, uh, like for wrestling, for instance, yeah, or like something in terms Making of like weight. MMA. Yeah, yeah, I would probably have to weigh nutrition a bit. Uh, higher. Yeah, so I feel like that's a not a fair comparison because even long before it became popular in all sports, that it was always like every wrestler is if you had to cut weight, you cut calories. Yeah, that's yeah. been around since the beginning of yeah, time. Yeah. That's not like the evolution of nutritional science. So I feel like that's not fair to add, or like bodybuilding could be considered a sport and we've sure. known for dieting for a show is like one of the most important so i i think other than those very specific situations yeah, so let's put those over here right i i think this is an even lower percentage than the mobility argument totally. that we made i would say 90 10 yeah i would say 10 percent. you know nutrition 90 percent. you know skill acquisition training strength yeah. training exercise programming so if you're an athlete and you want to improve your performance um, unless you're at the high, high level where your training programming is dialed, in which case I'd say maybe look at nutrition, you probably want to focus most of your energy on your workouts, mm -hmm. on the exercise portion. All right, the next one, longevity. So longevity is not just how long you live, it's also how long you live and you're healthy, however long you live. Because Western medicine has done a good job of stretching out our lifespan, but we find the last five to 10 years still to be pretty terrible. You know, just because a machine or, or some drugs can keep you alive isn't necessarily, you know, what I would consider longevity. Now, when we look at the studies on longevity, what we find is very unspecifics when it comes to exercise. It's like, you so long as you're active, that's okay, but the diet, boy, does that play a huge role in longevity. I was curious what direction you were going to go does. here, because I thought maybe we might have a little bit of debate here, because... I think this is going to be the first one that it's flip flopped. Yes. Yeah. Right. So for the first, because when you talk about all the blue zone stuff like that, there's people that don't even traditionally weight train or exercise. Most of them don't. Right. It's just the biggest commonality is a little bit of a reduction in calories. That's right. right. Yes. And, whole, and whole natural foods. Right? Yes. And just being active and outside. So I feel like this will be the first one where most everything is centered around how you eat. Yes. Now there is a caveat here, right? The caveat is if you're super sedentary. Uh, exercise makes a huge impact. So what I what I mean when I say, or what we mean when we say that diet is heavier on this than exercise, that just means that the exercise doesn't need to be spe super specific or programmed or you don't need to put a lot of planning into it. However, if you don't do any exercise at all, if you're the average American in your 70s, you can have the perfect diet, but if you're the average American sitting on your couch all day long and you start to literally wither away, lose muscle... Boy, one day a week of resistance training can make a dramatic improvement in your longevity. Oh, yeah. Every one of these categories, there's going to be this massive individual variance. Yeah, and yeah. there's always going to be outliers that someone's like, oh, that's not yeah. true for me. It's this, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, of course. But generally speaking, if you are just looking for longevity, right, yep. the person who eats really, really well yes. their whole life could never do any sort of structured training and they're so they, long as they're active and they're moving right right yep. they're going to be they're going to be pretty damn well in comparison to somebody who trains like crazy but then neglects a, yeah. a, a good diet yeah, yeah cuz we could get into quality but that's a different subject but yeah i would that's one of those things like community uh and and then just really being mindful of what you put in uh, your body is going to have like a massive impact on on how long you're going to you're going to be It around. does and what you'll find is the heavier it weighs on diet or the heavier it weighs on exercise, the more important the details are. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, for example, with performance, because it doesn't weigh very heavily on diet, that means eh, so long as you fuel your body and you have great, very structured you know, workout programs, you're going to do really well. On the reverse with longevity, 
it's like the diet needs to be very, very good. There's that's important right. no, fatty acid profile and the types of carbohydrates you intake and your yeah. protein. That's Macro, very important. Micronutrients. All yes. Those things. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then as far as exercise, so long active. as you're active. Exactly. So I would go I would go and say as extreme, as extreme as the other end of yeah. 90 10 this way. Yeah, it could be 90 10 or 80 20, something like that. I would, I would argue even it's just nutrition with longevity is so, so important. And so long as you're active, you're probably going to be uh, okay. All right, the next one, brain health. This is a big one. No, Doug, I ain't giving them 80, 20, 90, 10. You want to do 90, 10? I would say, I would say really? 90, I would say 90, 10, almost 95, five, five, because you literally could be someone who never exercises so long as you walk every day. Oh, if okay. You, Just if the you, active part. That's right. You, if you walked every day and ate perfect your whole life, you're signing up for probably a long, healthy life. I could, you know, I could get down with that mm -hmm. because uh, I could definitely get down with that. That's what the research is showing, right? Uh, when you look at, again, In some terms of these, blue zones. Yeah, yeah, these blue zones, they're basically just moving. You know, there's other factors, by the way. They have, you know, close friends and they have a good spiritual practice and all that. But you're right. They, they're they doing things like going fishing, you know, yes. you know, when they're 80 or I hike up the hill every day to grab water. And I think you nailed it perfectly. I mean, it just the, the smaller that number is, the less detail to that. Yeah. So I look at it, if I say five or 10%, that means that so long as you do something, right? Yeah. right? So long as you fish, you walk, you do something, mm -hmm. you're, you're addressing that five to 10%, most of the energy and focus on the 90% of what yes. will really make the impact. Yes. Brain health. Okay. This one, my opinion has changed uh, considerably. If you ask me five Five years ago, it would be different than what it is now. Mm. In the past, I would have said it was very similar to longevity where it was mostly diet. But now the current research is showing that what's very important for this is to maintain insulin sensitivity. You know, the, the most common, uh, you know, brain degenerative issue would be like Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, and, you know, researchers call those type three diabetes. Your ability to maintain good insulin sensitivity is very important. Now, of course, diet plays a role in that, but having muscle plays also a very, very large role. In fact, just building muscle, regardless of your weight, will improve your body's ability to react to insulin. In essence, improve your body's ability to utilize carbohydrates, sugars, glucose for energy, which again, this is why if you if you put someone on a uh, who has Alzheimer's on a ketogenic diet, they see improvements in cognition. It's not because the ketogenic diet's magic, but rather because at some point, their brain stopped working really well on carbohydrates, so they put them on ketones, and they seem to operate better. I thought yeah. you shared a study not that long ago too about like uh, the benefits of it too in regards to like stability training and, and challenging that way too. Yeah. Didn't you talk? Yes. About oh yeah. So here's the thing: oftentimes we think of the brain and we separate the body from the brain. So we think yeah. so long as you're thinking a lot, and like in the past they would say. Here's a great way to exercise your brain. And they'd say, like, do word puzzles. Learn a new language. Yes. Like, like develop a new hobby. Like, this is the only information we used to get about, like, yes. brain health. And now we're learning that uh, training your body in, in different ways and provides all this, this new stimulus. You think about all the neural pathways and yes. all the different types of stimulus your, your, your nervous system is providing you. Like, that's all through your body. And to be able to express all that through exercise and movement uh, really has a massive impact very on your well brain. said and and this is where i think like the contralateral training stability training yes. like cuz you and anybody if has ever done even something as simple as a, a bird dog right I, I remember getting my clients that were in advanced age and it actually sometimes you could see uh, the delay totally it takes them to do the opposite arm opposite leg they get down on all fours and then i'd say bring your right leg left leg out and they naturally want to do the same side. You, you can see them taking a moment there to like, oh, I have to fire this side and fire that side. And so for the ever, I've, I've known that's challenging. And then it's later on, I've seen the research that's come out to support the benefits of that. Oh, yeah. If you were to compare two groups of people and looking at their brain health and one group uh, did, and everything else was controlled, but one group did lots of brain challenging exercises and the other group just did balance and stability exercises challenge their brain that way you would actually see better brain health with the people who are moving the brain is intricately connected and tied to the body it's part of the body so moving the body challenging doing certain this is by the way why you lose skills you lose skills not because you lose muscle and strength but rather because your brain loses the ability to do those skills so it's like mm -hmm. you know people say oh i i you know i used to be able to squat and now i'm unstable or whatever yeah your muscles might be weaker but really your brain just kind of forgot almost the ability to do that kind of stuff so 
It's very important. Movement and exercise are very important for brain health, just like they are for muscle health. Do you guys have exercises that you have like told your clients, like, you know, hey, when you get way older and you don't care about so much how you look this and you just want to feel good, look good and like like overall health, like longevity what that you stick with, you should do forever. Like, do you have like specific ones or like ones that you like to, I have something. That's why I have one in mind. And I've, I've said this to clients before. I've like taught the exercise and they listen long after I'm gone. We don't have a relationship together. You're 30 years older and stuff like that. If you continue to keep this skill right here, the benefits that you will get for so many reasons. And that would be like a step up to a balance to a toe touch. Oh, sure. Oh, it seems like to say Turkish get up. It, yeah, but, oh, well, yeah. Another, that's another great, great another, another great one. That's what I meant. Like, see, yeah, it's mm -hmm. a great example of an exercise that is so good for this right here. When you talk about brain health, longevity, you know, people can, the strength community and the, and the, the, you know, muscle building people will shit yeah, on some of the, on it, Oh, yeah. they will. They'll make fun of movements like this, but here's an example where, and this is why I always tell trainers, be careful when you, you critique another coach or trainer that's teaching a mm -hmm. movement like this, that you may think is ridiculous or silly because you don't know the goals of that client. You don't know where they're currently at, or you don't know where they want to be in 20 or 30 years and a movement like a step up to a balance, to a hinge over and touch your toe, to be able to do that, the 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 what how it challenges the brain, the stability, the strength, yep. just the overall health that you get from a movement like that, or like a Turkish get up, I just think is well. Phenomenal. You look at people who've had uh, brain injuries when they go get physical therapy. They how do they <clears throat> rehab the brain? By doing exercises. You know, my grandmother went through this, right? Where they would have her try and hit a balloon that they would hit to her. And it was training and strengthening the brain. Now, in the past, I would have swore to God, I would have said, oh, it's 80% diet, 20% exercise, because I was under the mentality that the brain was like this separate thing. Now it's a 50 50. It's both, they're both equally important for brain health because I understand now that the brain is part of the body. It's no different yeah. than if you ask me the health of your bones or the health of your organs. We just organs. thought it was cognition only. Like yes. We, we just thought it was the education that you were building that brain muscle uh, with when, when in fact it's so interconnected with the body. It's, it, it's crazy. Totally. You know, you know, another one I really liked, uh, I'm just starting to think of all these exercises that I, I remember teaching like advanced age clients that you know, they don't come to you and, you know, someone who hires you. So this is all the coaches that are listening. That's 70 or 80 years old. Rarely ever they say, Hey, I want to get in that bikini body, you know, yeah, yeah. right. Or I want to build 15 pounds of muscle, right. They just want to live as long and as healthy yep. as they can. Yep. And so movements and exercises like the Turkish get up, like the step up to a balanced toe touch that these are so, so great for them. Yes. There's exercises that build more muscle, burn more calories, but there's another side to this that we're training. Another thing that you guys ever seen those balls that are like shaped, different so when you bounce they, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah they always go different directions yeah, and you got to react to that's it that's right so yeah. i i'd have a client where well, that's all that was part of our training you know for like 10 minutes i would just bounce the ball back and forth yep. with him and he'd have to grab it because every time it, it Dude, reacts differently i'm telling you okay i trained uh people in advanced age quite a bit towards the end of my career it became one of my specialties a lot of the doctors i trained would send me their patients and all the doctors would remark after you know after six months or so like you know, so and so so much sharper. Their moods are totally different. They're 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 telling these jokes. Their memory seems to be better. I would see this all the time in the people that I trained. Not just the physical changes where they were stronger, they could stand up, you know, better. They could sit down and squat. They could reach their arm up above, above up above their head. But I'd also notice changes in positive changes in their personalities and how fast they were to think. And then I remember once I had a client, I've told this story before, it's a very terrifying thing for me to witness. I had a lady that was already in early stages of dementia and her daughter brought her to me. And I trained this woman for years and I noticed ever so slight declines in her mental capacity or maybe they kind of stayed the same. I would say maybe what I noticed is she would kind of tell the same story over and over again. But remember, this woman was, at this point, she was in her late 70s getting into her 80s, and she already was in early stages of dementia. Then she fell at home, broke a bone. Her daughter no longer could afford to hire me. I ran into this woman. It was like, no joke. It was months later. It wasn't years later. It was months later at the grocery store. She didn't even recognize me. That's how, and this is a woman I trained for years. That's how fast that cognitive decline went down because she could no longer move and exercise. So exercise, extremely important for brain health. 
And of course, diet, very important. I don't okay, think I need so to make what's that our, case. What's our score for this? I would say 50 50. I could even be convinced to say 60% exercise. Higher, yeah, that's obviously. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting because I feel like in the past, just 10 years ago, you would make the case the other way. For Absolutely. Right. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I, I would even, I, you could easily push me to say, 60-50. In fact, let's do 60-50. 60-40. Yeah. yeah, or excuse me, 60-40. Math. That's, that's <laughs> right. Speaking so of brain health. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, I do everything 110%. That's right. Yeah, he goes uh, beyond. That always annoys me yeah. when people say that. Oh, I know. How's that possible? Yeah. <laughs> There's only 100. All right, 60-40. Right. Let's talk about hormone health, all right? So when we're talking about hormone health, I think we're talking about uh, it, typically it's are your hormones balanced? Are they making you feel good? Is your energy levels good? Uh, your libido good? Usually, I would say people refer to more youthful levels of hormones as being healthy, right? So as you get older as a man, testosterone levels maintaining kind of where they were when you were in your 20s or 30s. With women, we get this nice balance of estrogen and progesterone, good growth hormone, sensitivity to insulin, uh, a nice, healthy, appropriate cortisol response, all those things, right? So let's talk about diet first. Can diet positively or negatively affect uh, your hormones? Oh, one one hundred percent. In fact, that this was um, it's a big one. Almost the, the we talked about this on the show that how uh, when I get a client, almost every female client that I had that was uh, having like hormonal issues. Almost always, one of the things that we just simply bumping their healthy fats or increasing proteins yeah. solve the problem. Especially because they're typically chronic dieters, right? Yes. And that wasn't everybody, but a, a large portion of female clients that I got that would, would complain of, of hormone imbalances. Mm -hmm. One, it was as simple as a fit of, of feeding them some more calories and primarily yes. coming from healthy just, fats. Just being well fed, yeah, too, was a yes. massive contributor. Yes, and we we just came out of that the era of demonizing fat, and and fat plays such a uh, such a role in hormonal health. And so they would be so. I'd look at their diet and they're eating like ten grams of fat. Dude, same thing here. I would get clients, same exact thing, 10, 20 grams of fat. And I remember when I would see something like this part of me would get excited. One of the things that gets me excited as a trainer is knowing that there's a single thing that I can do that will make a huge impact. Because I want to show this person the value in what we can do and something that they can control quite easily. So I would literally tell them, I want you to add an avocado and a fatty piece of meat or something like that every single day, right? Or something, mm -hmm. something like that along those lines. And they'd be like, are you sure? Like, yes, trust me. And sure enough, within a month or two, they were like, whoa, I feel so different. Well, because too, you could see the opposite when the calories have been super low for a really long period of time. What happens inevitably, you, you know, you start to see they'll lose their period, they'll lose hair, yes. their skin's affected. Like you see the ramifications of, you know, a poor nutrition strategy, like very visibly. Right, right. And then with men, I mean, nutrient deficiencies, boy, do those cause problems with testosterone. Zinc and vitamin D are actually quite common to be issues with uh, men with low testosterone. In fact, if a guy, especially if he's young, shows up and gets tested for low testosterone, the doctor's going to look at a few things, sleep, one of them, and then the other one is, let's test your nutrient levels. Your, your, your zinc and your vitamin D may be low, and that may be causing issues uh, with your testosterone. And then, of course, are they eating way too many calories for too long or too low of calories for too long? And then especially, by the way, this is something we haven't touched upon, when your calories are really high, it matters more what those, where those calories come from than when they are than the, when they tend to be low. When they tend to be low, you get away with a little bit more. Now, I have a question for yourself. You know, I'm curious if you know the answer to this. Is it is it directly connected also to the libido? Because I remember even when I was taking you know synthetic testosterone, so if you were to measure my blood, you would see yeah. high levels of testosterone. Yet when I get to the last two weeks, like before a show, because I had been dieting so hard for so many weeks, I would completely lose my sex drive. But yet, if you were to measure my testosterone levels, my testosterone levels would say, would be really high. So, are I mean, does that also affect just a, a yes. male who's decreasing his, even if he has high testosterone levels, can also lose his libido because he's not yeah. eating enough calories? You know, we often talk about testosterone because it's yeah. like the main driver of that, but so many things play a role in libido. I mean, psychologically, there's roles that play that, that you know play a role in libido. Like you could be stressed out. And that would make you not feel like you're very much in the mood. But there's so many different things. Libido is actually quite complex. If you're not healthy, you typically 
will have a low libido. Right. And let's be honest. Actually, I, I used to love that you used to do this, Adam. This was really cool. You're the only person I know that would do this is you would go so far before a show and then you would tell your audience, this is the part where it's unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. You'd say, okay, I'm up, up until now. And I don't know how many weeks out that would typically yeah, be. Yeah, it would normally be up until the last, like I would stay really, I, I would consider eating healthy, training healthy, uh, until about two, three weeks out. And then at that point, I know that I was crossing the line. I knew that I was about to go to extremely low body fats. I know that's not a healthy place to be. I know I'd be depriving myself mm -hmm. of nutrients like my body. I'd be pushing my body past. And so I may, I would make that switch and I would, I would always, you know, talk to my Instagram when I was talking to people on, on there and say, okay, like, you know, up until this point, everything I've been showing you, the average person could follow me, right? So even if you weren't trying to compete, you could follow the tips that I'm giving as far as nutrition and exercise. And I think it's a really good advice for everybody. Now I'm crossing that line. Yep, now yep. I'm going beyond that. I know that I'm chasing an aesthetic look for stage for sport. And therefore this is not healthy. Right. Now let's talk about exercise. Okay. For hormones. One form of exercise actually has pretty profound. We've talked about this so many times, profound effects on hormones and that's strength training or resistance training. And this is because that form of exercise is pro-tissue, meaning the main signal that it sends is to add active tissue, which is muscle. Now, what the body needs to build muscle are these hormones, right? So if a man's body wants to build muscle, it's fed properly, you're sending a signal to build muscle with good strength training or resistance training, it's going to need more testosterone, it's going to need more androgen receptors. These are the receptors that testosterone attaches to. You're going to need to have more insulin sensitivity. Remember, insulin is also, in fact, insulin is the most anabolic hormone. A lot of people don't know this. You're going to need to have better growth hormone responses. Your cortisol can't be high all the time because that eats away at muscle. And for women, progesterone and estrogen need to be more balanced out. Imbalances there will prevent muscle gain, actually cause fat gain. So when you're doing a pro-tissue form of exercise like strength training or resistance training, it has a pretty profound effect on hormone levels. In fact, it's profound enough to where you could take any man and simply having him do an appropriate amount of, of resistance training, you will notice an increase in testosterone and an increase in androgen. Well, it's important to bring density. that up as a differentiating uh, point in, in terms of how you're training because yes. if you were just dependent on – uh, high cardiovascular output and, and you're putting all your eggs in that basket, it could be a detrimental towards your hormone balance. Yes, you're well, right. Well, I was really curious where you, you guys were going to put the percentage here because, again, this is talking about my own experience, but I, I was fascinated by this. Um, when I came off of taking synthetic testosterone, uh, I had went through one of the hardest times in my life. I mean, I battled with depression because my testosterone levels were so low. And the goal was, can I bring it up naturally? And I was doing all the things you could think of, infrared and focus on sleep and doing diets, diet-related stuff. I was taking supplements that Sal was re re telling me to do. But one of the things that I personally felt more than anything else mm -hmm. was coming in and strength training, heavy lifting, I, and, and not... And I got to be clear here. I remember you saying you would notice the day of or the day yes. after. Yes, it, and, it, and it wasn't yep. intensely training. It wasn't like when I say heavy lifting, I don't mean like killing it in the gym. I mean just some good, a heavy five by five. And that's all I would do. I'd come in and just squat five sets and do five heavy five by five type of lifting. And I would feel mm -hmm. this, this little spike the next 24 to 48 hours afterwards, more than I felt from any of the supplements wow. or sleep or the diet being all dyed or the infrared, all those other things that I was doing in, in conjunction with that. I felt the the strength training. I personally felt that affect my, my hormone levels more than anything else. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting when you would do that, you would, you would come in, you would comment on it, just how much of an effect it had uh, on your body. I would see this with clients. Uh, all the time, all the time. I would, at one point, I had a lot of guys that would come to me with testosterone issues, again, sent to me by doctors. And it was the strength training, resistance training. And these guys were trying, they were doing everything. And it made that big of an impact. Now, I'm going to give two different scores on this one because it's mm. different for men than it is for women. Mm. By the way, uh, when I talked about androgen receptor density, they're now finding in studies that that's the most important factor, more important even than testosterone levels. They actually did a study where they compared men uh, and their testosterone levels to see who built more muscle. And what they found was that so long as they were within a you know a reasonable range, it wasn't a big difference. The difference came from how many receptors they had for that testosterone. 
resistance training always upregulates uh, androgen receptors. It always makes that big of a difference. Mm. Now, when it comes to hormone health for men, I'm going to say that this is more 70-30. 70 exercise, 30 nutrition. I can almost, I mean, you will pretty much reliably benefit a man's hormones with exercise regardless of their diet. Now, with women, their exercise is still very important, but they tend to be more sensitive, in my opinion, to nutrition. To nutrition. I would say 50 50 with so women. I would say, fi- or 60 40, I would say. Yeah. I would say 70 30 for men, 60 40 for, uh, for women. Do you, how do you guys feel? 60 about that? on nutrition or yeah, 60, 60 on exercise? Exercise. On exercise. 60 on exercise, 40 on nutrition. Oh, I would push it even higher on nutrition for women. I would go 50 50. So you think 50 50? Yeah, I would say 50 50 with women on nutrition and strength training right down I the middle. I get behind that. Yeah. And, and 70 then, 30 for men? Yeah, I like that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get behind that. All right, let's talk about sleep how each of them affect uh, your sleep quality. So when we look at the studies, we can clearly see that diet plays a definite role in your quality of sleep. Um, Definitely, if you eat foods that uh, make you obese, that can affect your sleep. If you eat foods that- Stimulants? Yeah. That's got to count. Gosh, if we include stimulants, for sure, right? I mean, you're eating it, right? Yeah. No, that's a good point. That's a very, very good point. Uh, If it affects your digestion- That 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 alone alone raises it way No, yeah, that alone skews it way to that side right away, right? It does. It does. It makes a big difference um, with the stimulants. Now that you said that, I I think I'd want to change my score. Um, Digestion. If you're you're eating foods that you're intolerant to that are causing- uh, inflammation, heartburn, you know, uh, mm. that kind of stuff. Boy, does that have a big impact uh, on your sleep. Uh, but exercise, let's talk about exercise now. Exercise almost reliably improves sleep. In fact, in studies, pretty much any time they just add some exercise, so long as it's appropriate, they sleep better. I know I'm sharing personal experience stuff, and I know that doesn't count, right? But I tell you, one of the things that I always notice as soon as I start my routine back up, I always sleep better at yeah. nighttime. Yes. And if I ever if I ever find that I'm restless, it's almost always because I didn't get my lift in that day. Mm-hmm. There's something to that restlessness of like wasted energy or unused energy. Because I, I, I feel like my mind will just keep sort of trying to use it somehow. And, and, and that's what's keeping me up. Sometimes if I'm exhausted, I'm uh, my sleep is just immediately better. And my theory on this is that this is this is getting progressively worse uh, as as you know, we evolve totally right? because tech and we're becoming so sedentary as humans in general, like this probably wasn't as big of a deal 50 years ago when yep. almost every job, yeah, everything was exhausting. Yeah. Everything was exhausting. You guys, I never had a problem sleeping when I went to work with my dad all day long in construction. Like mm-hmm. you come home, I didn't need a lift. I didn't need to exercise that day uh, to like I'm pass. Out. Yeah. To pass out. But we just, we don't tend to expend the same kind of energy that we're, I think we evolved to be able to do. And we sit down, we stare at screens, which stimulate the brain all day long. And then you think you're just going to go lay down in bed and your body's just like, no, I got so much more I could do. No, sleep issues are uh, an epidemic these days. And I think it's more related to the fact that we just don't move than it is to our poor diet. Our diets have been shitty for longer than the fact that we have been as a sedentary yeah. as we are. The The lack of activity has dropped very, very, or has increased, I should say, uh, sharply over the last uh, couple decades. I saw this with my kid, by the way, the other day. My son, if it wasn't for structured workouts, I swear to God, the kid would, he would literally morph into the couch or into his bed, right? His, he does all the schoolwork. He studies a lot. Everything he enjoys involves his computer. That's how he meets up with his friends or whatever. And yesterday, he had a scheduled workout with Serene. I've had him train with uh, our personal trainer who's on our YouTube channel, Serene. She's amazing, right? And it was so funny last night. And my kid has sleep issues. He'll stay up all night. Last night, he comes downstairs and he goes, oh, I'm going to be going to bed now. It was like 9.45. (laughs) And I'm like, what? Who are you? Why? Because he worked out. Yeah. He worked out that day. So when it comes to sleep, I think uh, I would go 70 exercise, uh, 30 nutrition. Um, And again, this is based off of what I've seen with uh, with the studies, I could be pushed sixty forty because you threw in stimulants there, yeah, Justin. Yeah, that's where I was leaning. But uh, again, yeah. the, the, I just think that that's a massive. I want. I know I'm going to give it sixty forty for that because who the hell do you guys know that don't drink coffee? That's the thing. Yeah, it's so, so popular. Yeah, who the hell do you know that does not drink coffee? Or pre workouts at this point. And when I think of when I look back at all my clients and, and that was someone that was struggling with sleep, I would say more often than not fixing the either the time or the amount of caffeine that they are intaking was one of the first offenders that we yeah, would fix. Yeah, that's a good point. So because of that, because yeah. it is one of the number one things that I would adjust as a trainer, mm-hmm. I got to lean that a little bit more that direction. So I, I would go 60-40. You could even push me 50-50 on this one. Okay, so that's 60, good. I'll 40. go 60-40. Yeah. Um, all right, life quality. Quality of life. This encompasses uh, pretty much everything 
uh, that we talked about. Like, how much do you enjoy your life? How challenging is your life in negative ways? That you know, are you getting meaning out of it? Are you able to do the things that you want to do? You know, oftentimes when we talk about life quality. What really contributes to negative life quality is you want to do something but you can't. Right? Like, I want to walk to my friend's house, but I can't, or I want to do things for myself. This is a big one people don't think about. As people age, one of the main reasons why their quality of life declines is because they're not independent anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't drive. I can't go up the stairs. I have to rely on someone to help me out all the time. So when it comes to life quality and all of those things, this for me is very easy. It's 50-50. This is very even. Your diet includes is the longevity. We talked about 90% being with longevity, but your exercise keeps you moving, keeps you strong, keeps you mobile, mobile, allows you to do all those things. I can't see how either one uh, Well, you know, and especially the, the second component of their mood. Like I yes. you just know right away when you're eating the right types of foods that are benefiting you and, yep. and it's not just about flavor and just about, you know, calories. It's about like, you know, what quality of food you're putting into your body, but then also like what kind of movements are you doing and, and if you feel strong and able bodied, like what kind of mood that puts you in, it's huge. Yeah. I think there's something you need to add to talking about diet when it's related to to mood and like quality of life though is uh it, it doesn't mean being on a diet or restricting forever is what's most beneficial either it's the ability to have that balance where you can enjoy that's a big part right yes I, so I mean, that's important right you, you don't want to be caught the other direction where it's like oh the guys say that it's 50 50 diet for quality of life so i'm going to stay on a diet no my whole life like that's not i think you have to explain that, that. is a very very good point look i come from my my parents are, come from a culture that celebrates food it's such a big part of uh you know of, of where my parents came from from in, in Sicily or in Italy, um, you need to be able to enjoy food also for its palatable abilities, for enjoying the way it tastes it's and the like way a it, celebration, the yeah. way it brings people together. Um, so no, your balance is very important with this, right? Bal- and same thing with exercise. Like we say, oh, exercise is real important. That doesn't mean like you're so rigid with your workouts that you miss your kids, you know, <laughs> you know, game or you end up not having any friends because you're always working out. Balance is very important, but you know, I think Jack Lane's comment about exercise and diet, both needing them both to create a kingdom, I think that really encompasses life quality. You need to have them both. You can't just have one. And I think that was at the ending music there. there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wrap it up here, Sal. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. We've got so much great free stuff you can download. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Our vulnerability is when we don't wake up every day and ask ourselves, why are people working out and what do we need to do to keep them consistent? Mm-hmm. At some point, it may become more about education. It may become about, you know, giving them different types of routines. It might be about understanding that when people do begin to fall off the wagon, because maybe they had a life event, maybe they had a kid, how 